But I'm sure the meeting is live now. Thank you, Haruka, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to now call the meeting to order. And as we usually do, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We recognize the peace and friendship treaties signed between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq. We're all treaty people and we have rights and responsibilities as Mi'kmaq and settlers alike. So just to confirm everybody's um, camera and audio is working. Uh, Hanin, I see you there, welcome. And Caroline and Amy. So I think we're, we're good to go. The first uh, item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes that have been circulated. And I would ask if there are any um, errors or omissions. Uh, there being none, then I would ask for a motion to uh, accept the uh, and approve the minutes as circulated. So move. Councillor Stoddard, sorry. Moved, yeah, thank you. Moved by Councillor Stoddard, and do I have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Christine. Seconded by Christine. Um, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. say nay. Motion is carried. Next item of business is approval of the uh, order of business and any additions or deletions to the agenda as circulated. Are there any additions or deletions? All right, uh, there being none, um, I would ask uh, for a motion to approve the agenda as uh, presented. I so move that we accept the motion as presented, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. And could I have a seconder, please? I can second it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stoddard. So all those in favor of uh, the motion to accept the uh, and approve the agenda as circulated, indicate by saying aye. Um, aye. aye. And opposed, indicate by saying nay. The motion is carried. Uh, item four, business arising out of the minutes. Uh, I don't believe we have any uh, business that has arisen from the minutes. That leads us to item number five. Are there any um, individuals here who would like to declare a conflict of interest? No, so we will carry on. Uh, item six, consideration of deferred business. There is none. Uh, correspondence, we have three items of correspondence that were uh, circulated to you with regards to uh, correspondence that we've, um, we have before us. We can either receive it and take no action or receive uh, correspondence with some notes or forward it to staff for their consideration and information, or we can talk about it at another meeting. So I'm now just looking for your direction on these pieces of correspondence that you have before you. Um, does anyone have an opinion about what we, how you would like to deal with this correspondence? I would like to discuss the MIA correspondence. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's uh, from the executive director of the YWCA, Mia Suokanancio. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Mia. Uh, go ahead, Hanin. Um, so I, I think this was a follow-up to the presentation that we got from the Home for Good project. And it was just a bit, a, a list of um, recommendations and a bit of a sum up of everything that we talked about. And it was following up on the motion that Holly and I and Jane as well helped with the motion that was passed, but then needed to be adjusted a little bit. And so I'm hoping that we can use this correspondence to perfect that other motion and sort of get things moving along. Okay, so um, Hanin, would you uh, be willing to kind of lead um, a conversation about that uh, between now and the next meeting so that you might be prepared to bring something forward? Yes, certainly. 
Okay, that would be great. Is anyone willing to give a hand to Hanin on this? I know Tanya often helps you out with, uh, with emotions and unfortunately she's not able to be here today. I can help uh, Hanin with this one. Oh, that would be great, Christine. Yeah, I think two is sufficient. Um, if the two of you kind of put your heads together over the next um, month, and I'm certainly willing to help out as well. Um, I think something something could come from that. Would that uh, be satisfactory to you, honey? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so, uh, so we'll receive that correspondence and uh, proceed to take a little bit of action on that. Um, the other two pieces of correspondence, uh, since nobody has said anything, I think we'll just receive them and take no action on those. I'm just checking with you, Haruka, do I need a motion on that? Oh, sorry, I, Lily. The, yes, you wanted to add, sorry. Yeah, I just noticed the other two correspondences were around this survey about anti-Asian racism that they're asking if we would fill out. So I guess I'm wondering, is that something as a committee that we can, or have a representative of the committee fill out, or is, um, because I mean, I think that it'd be, it, wouldn't take a lot of our time and would be valuable for um, input from our committee to be represented in their survey, but I don't know um, yeah. what the process for that would be. Lily, um, the um, issue I think, and I actually haven't communicated with the uh, two people that sent the correspondence, but the deadline, we've missed the deadline for responding to the survey. It was back in September and uh, so I just assumed that, that we had missed it. Um, I guess perhaps we don't need to make that assumption. We could check and see whether they would be open to um, still receiving uh, a response. Uh, would you like me to do that? Yeah, I think it'd be worthwhile to say, you know, to say that we've received in like, we're sorry to have missed the deadline, but interested to see if there are ways we could contribute or something like that. Okay. All right, I will, uh, I will be in touch with them then and, okay. uh, and put that question to them. Thank you for that. All right, I'm just checking Haruka, do we need, I don't think we need motions on this, on these two actions, do we? Uh, it is up to the committee, uh, Madam Chair, if we want to formalize the process, uh, it's okay to indicate by moving the motion, but if not, uh, what the committee just discussed will be sufficient and I'll be taking notes. That minutes. will be that will be reflected in the minutes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, we'll be. I'm satisfied with that. We'll it'll reflect in the minutes that Hanin and Christine are going to uh, work on developing a motion from our first piece of correspondence, and that I will be in touch with the uh, Hashim and Lee, um, Mohammed Hashim and uh, Angela Lee, and ask them whether or not we are able to uh, participate in the survey even at this late date. Okay, let's proceed on to um, petitions. There are none. And so that brings us to our first presentation. And I'm hoping that, I don't know, I can't see, I'm hoping that Noreen is here. Are you here, Noreen? Haruka, can you see? Yes, Noreen is in the meeting. Okay. I will just ask to unmute. Okay, Noreen is in. Good afternoon to you all. Good um, afternoon, Noreen. We're, I'm, I'm very pleased to see you here. Uh, welcome. Thank Noreen, you. Noreen is here representing the Ecology Action Center. And she's going to talk with us about um, the impact of climate change on women. Um, Noreen, I was just going to kind of remind you of the process that we use. We um, uh, will listen to you maybe for 15 minutes or so, however long, you know, about that time that you might present. And then what we will do is kind of go around um, and uh, ensure that every uh, committee member has a chance to make comments or ask you questions. So thanks again for being here. It's a very timely topic and uh, we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, no, um, thanks for having me. Um, 
I did understand in the instructions, I was meant to send some slides over and someone would be controlling the slides, so. Yes, it um, will be up soon. All right, cool. Sorry, just bear with me one second. Okay, so um, hello again, and thanks for having me at your meeting today. So uh, my name is Noreen Mabiza, and I'm energy coordinator focused on sustainable communities at the Ecology Action Center. And um, Sorry, my screens. Yeah, um, focused on sustainable communities at the Ecology Action Center. And my work focuses on the intersections between social justice and the climate movement. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you all about um, climate change and women this afternoon. So yeah, next slide, please. Um, so to begin with, I'll briefly talk about climate justice. So what climate justice does is it shifts the conversation on climate change from a scientific technical based one to one about human rights and social justice. And what this means is recognizing that climate change has negative impacts on most people in the world, but it, it impacts those who have been historically marginalized um, the most. So marginalized populations experience what we know as climate injustice, and they are often underrepresented in the spaces where climate decisions are made. So what climate injustice is, is it refers to the unfair distribution of benefits and damages related to climate change. And when we speak of marginalized populations who are affected by these injustices, uh, women are, you know, one of those groups that experience um, climate injustice. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, women's increased vulnerability to impacts of climate change are as a result of social and economic factors. Worldwide, women have less access than men to resources such as income, land, decision-making structures, and technology that would enhance their capacity to adapt to climate change. And what we see is there are very few studies that thoroughly look into the impacts of climate change on women in the global north. Uh, studies have traditionally focused on the impacts to women in developing nations, where they look into how women as providers for the home, how they rely on the land, and they've researched into how climate change is going to impact those groups of women. Um, but the lack of research obviously is not to say that women are not being impacted and that's women here in the global north. So as we look at the few impacts of climate change that will affect Atlantic Canada, which is what you're seeing um, on the slide there, one can, you know, start to come up with some ideas on how women could be heavily impacted. So I'm just going to talk through some of that um, right now. So to begin with, I did some digging into some statistics and I found an article from 2019 by Suzanne Rent in the Halifax Examiner, where she did some digging to find out where exactly are the areas that women are employed um, here in Nova Scotia. And she found that uh, the service producing sectors, healthcare and social assistance, educational services, and accommodations and food services are the industries that find the highest number of women being employed in there, where women employed are higher than the men um, in those industries. So with this in mind, knowing the numbers, if we look at the impacts on screen, we've got increased storm intensity, coastal erosion, flooding, and increased temperatures. And these will affect um, Atlantic Canada. And in many cases, I've already um, begun to see so. We can begin to talk through how women here in Nova Scotia, Atlantic Canada will be impacted. So the first three, um, let's think about the tourism industry. So if you've got increased storm intensity, you've got coastal erosion, you've got flooding, this is significantly, significantly going to impact the tourism industry, which from the statistics from uh, Suzanne Rent, we know that women are heavily employed 
in that industry. So they're going to have to uh, either end up being underemployed or having to look for alternative work um, if the seasons are shifting and tourism can no longer take place the way um, it has traditionally taken place. And then if we move on, uh, for the large number of women who are employed in healthcare and social assistance, as temperatures increase, what we're going to see are more people um, suffering health impacts. People are going to get sick if we have heat waves, people will suffer from heat strokes and um, all sorts of different uh, medical impacts that will arise from increased temperatures. And those women in the healthcare sector, this means the burden is going to fall on them, the burden of caring for um, these populations. And um, they, as well as women who provide social assistance, they're going to have to care as people's loved ones get sick, there's need for care, there's social assistance, there's programs that need to exist to support people. So yet again, these are all burdens are going to fall on women. And then if we think about women in educational uh, services, many of them bear the burden of having to teach about the impacts of climate change. And um, this has already started to happen and they're doing so oftentimes not um, supported thoroughly enough by the curriculums that are yet to you know, thoroughly bring climate change um, into the curriculum. So women have to go in there and begin to teach our youth and people at all different um, levels about climate change, all the while they're experiencing it um, as well. So again, I re reiterate that few studies have thoroughly looked into the impacts of climate change on women in developing nations like Canada, but just through these four examples and looking at other statistics uh, of where women are employed, we begin to start to get a picture of how disproportionately women are going to be impacted um, by climate change. So what's happening now and what we're seeing is that in order to tackle the impacts of climate change, governments are introducing different mitigation and adaptation strategies. And this is where some of my advocacy work lies. And it's ensuring that strategies that are adopted are just and that they leave no one behind. So when we talk of climate mitigation, we're talking of actions to limit global warming and its related effects. So getting rid of fossil fuels, switching to electric, vehicles, those sorts of things are what we're talking about. And then adaptation prepares societies for future climate impacts um, and those that are going to take place regardless of the mitigation measures we take. So next slide, please. So we'll move on to just transition, which is one of the concepts that's being used to inform some of the adaptation strategies that are being put in place. So the concept of just transition has existed within North American labor movements since the 1970s, and it is in response to environmental policies. And as the 2000s set in, the concept became more mainstream as more and more debate over climate policy began to take place. Here in Canada, we saw just transition showing up after the 2015 Paris Agreement, where the agreement actually acknowledged just transition and said that imperative of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of um, decent work and quality jobs. So they acknowledged the relationship between having to bring in just transition as we adapt to climate change. And what you find in reading around and in documents is that the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives understands just transition as a social justice framework for facilitating the shift to a zero carbon economy in a way that ensures productive and equitable outcomes for workers. So at the EAC, we support this framework and we agree that just transition means that the cost of phasing out fuels uh, fossil fuels are not unfairly borne by workers and that the benefits of a green economy are fairly distributed. So this is to say we believe for the transition to truly be just, it also has to rectify the inequities we find in the current workforce. And to begin with, it's crucial that as we adapt to the uh, impacts of climate change and introduce new industries, 
women are not once again left behind. So these fossil fuel industries, what we see is traditionally women have been underemployed in them. This is um, car manufacturing, building, coal factories. Women are not highly employed in them. So if governments are simply going to transition these workers to work into the green economy, there's a misstep if there's no action taken to actually bring women um, into these industries. So what is important is that programs that are going to provide skills training for women who want to enter this green economy should be made available. It is also important to provide training for their male colleagues who have been employed in the fossil fuel industry and traditionally have worked in male dominated industries so that they can know how to make workplaces welcoming and safe environments where these women want to remain. So in as much as it is important to recruit women in high numbers to these industries, there also needs to be work done around training um, their colleagues on how to make these workplaces as welcoming as possible. So um, a second point to be raised as we look at just transition is just one of these adaptation uh, measures that's being taken is that what current governments are doing as they're transitioning fossil fuel workers is that they're offering uh, pension packages to those who want to, who need to leave. They're offering different kinds of money for people to relocate. But there's this huge gap where they're leaving out um, impacted groups and workers who benefit from having fossil fuel industries in their communities. So for instance, in a core community, you're going to have food service providers, you're going to have healthcare centers, you're going to have retail centers, again, all industries we've seen from statistics that women are highly employed in. Um, so while the fossil fuel workers are getting pension packages and leaving and you know leaving the community, they can't be left stranded. We need to ensure that government also gets into consultation with communities that are going to be impacted so that there's a plan for them on what they can do as these industries they've been relying on to boost their communities uh, begin to move away. So next slide, please. So I'll just jump into a bit of what we do at the Ecology Action Center to promote uh, climate justice and just transition. Um, so to speak a bit on respectful allyship as well as coalition building, we do recognize that many groups in Nova Scotia, especially indigenous groups and grassroots organizations are also working for climate justice. Uh, and our ongoing relationship with allies in anti-poverty and social justice movements provides many opportunities to learn, share guidance and establish mutual values. So what we are committed, committed to is seeking common ground with new and sometimes unlikely allies. And we do recognize that the EAC is uniquely positioned and privileged within the climate justice movement. And we're committed to using this unique position and privilege to make space for frontline voices that are often marginalized. And we know that the diversity within our communities is a source of strength and depth as we build a united movement for change. Uh, and many of these ideas apply as we build coalitions that are focused on bringing people from a wide variety of backgrounds together in one space um, to work towards the common goals we aim to achieve. And yet again, in our policy advocacy work, you'll see the lenses of just transition follow, um, coming through. You see no one left behind. These are all things we push for when we get a chance to be at the table with decision makers. When we put forward policy documents or research that we've done, we always try to ensure that um, these are all reflected. So yeah, um, next slide, please. So thank you all for listening to my presentation and I'm happy to take questions and discuss this some more. Thank you, Noreen, thank you very much. So uh, like we usually do, we'll, we'll go around the table and um, around the screen, I guess I would, would be a better way to put it. Hanin, how about we start with you? If you have any comments or questions, we welcome them. Thank you very much, Noreen, uh, for that presentation. I really appreciated the graphics. 
Um, it was different than anything that we've had. Um, I guess the question, I, I ask this of a lot of presenters and I'm sure my committee members are a little sick of it, but how can, how can we help? What do you think that we can do as the Women's Advisory Committee to bring forward some change um, and help women in, in this context of climate change? Yeah, um, I think, again, just going back to this day's power and our numbers, day's power and having our voices out there. So whenever you folks have the opportunity, whether it's going out there and speaking to the decision makers and saying, you know, we need to see this change, that's just as powerful as if you have opportunity to go into community, talk to the women who are going to be impacted, talk to young women who are thinking about how they're going to be what jobs they want and just talk to them and gain that understanding of how to shape this green economy because how to shape this green economy without um, leaving them behind. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anine. Uh Lily, would you like to, any comments or questions from you? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Noreen. It's great to, yeah, to, to hear from you and this is a great presentation. I was actually going to ask the same thing that Hineen did. Um, but I guess I'm wondering too, in your work, have you encountered you know, any areas locally in which you think um, the work to Im improve on climate justice and including you know, work on um, issues pertaining to women and, and other and non-binary genders um, could be improved locally. I mean, obviously I'm sure you've, you know, come into contact with you know, municipal programs or local, local or, um, programs and, and actions around climate change. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you've encountered any specific um, challenges or areas in which there really could be an improvement. Yeah, so I think um, the main thing in my work, again, with how, you know, trying to do my work as grounded in community as possible, it's about that going out and hearing from these groups and bringing these groups that will be impacted together into the room. So, you know, I do a lot of research on the computer and read all these things about how great it is to bring these people to the forefront. And what I often see what's missing is actually identifying any spaces that have been created to talk to, you know, the people who will um, be impacted by this transition. But then on the other hand, I do see there are lots of programs that are out there that are already starting to focus on getting women into the trades. There's um, programs for young high school aged women to uh, tr train them in STEM and just encourage them to enter some of these fields. So work is being done and I guess there's always more to be done. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lily, and thanks, Anarin. Um, Joanne, you're next. I know Joanne has, uh, is trying to save her voice. She's got a little trouble there with the vocal cords, but uh, she may have some comments or questions. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll just say that. Um, well, first of all, Noreen, thanks so much for your presentation. And I know that EAC does really good work. Um, and I, this isn't really a question so much, I guess, is that there is a lot of um, a, a, a sort of a feeling of hopelessness among a lot of people. And we see it with, you know, I think Lily was talking earlier about COP26. And so this is 26 and we're still not doing what needs to be done. And um, you probably don't I see, I, I I think that's why I say it's not really a question, it's more an acknowledgement, I guess. And then how we might, I don't know, since we're working with the, uh, with HRM council, is there a way, is there something that we can do that's more than writing letters or talking to people? Yeah, and I totally hear you about that feeling of hopelessness and, you know, just people being like, what, well, what else can we do, especially um, being in this sort of work um, every day. And I don't know if, you know, so much if this answer will help you and what you can do, but just to sort of give some insight into some of what we try to do at the EAC to 
take away from some of those uh, feelings of hopelessness. Of course, we acknowledge that, you know, it is, it does feel very hopeless at times. But uh, what we want to really push towards is just visioning. So there's this power that lies in having hope and just visioning. What do we want a climate just 20 30 to look like a climate just 2025. And one of the things that has actually come out of that is the 2030 network, which I'm not sure a few folks are familiar with, but it's, you know, a group of people from all sorts of different backgrounds, labor organizations, students, um, indigenous groups, and they, the 2030 network came together and was convened to envision what a climate just future would look like. So as much as we lack hope and as much as we feel defeated, there's just this power that comes together when groups get together and still find, try to find some of those pieces of hope and do that visioning of what is possible, what can we do? So just sometimes a reframing of how we talk about these issues we find can really go a long way to keep pushing people. Yeah, thanks, Noreen. I agree so much with what you're saying about that reframing. Um, Lisa, there you go. It's your turn. Hi there. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. That was fantastic. I'm just uh, actually, uh, uh, I guess it's more of a comment than anything. Um, just very surprised at how little research there is into the impacts of climate change on women outside of the uh, developing world. I mean, as uh, has been pointed out, we're now at COP26. Climate change is not a new thing. And uh, I just wonder, you know, why, why do you think there is so little research into uh, Western uh, countries and climate change and, uh, and where women fit into uh, to all of that. Um, just wondering if you've had conversations, uh, you know, just uh, among your peers as to why, why there is so little research. Yeah, and you know, this just being my own personal opinion and from sure. conversation with peers, I guess, you know, what we often find in development studies and in research, it's this obsession of the global south, the they need our help, what's going on down there. So, you know, there's been lots of research about that in those mm. cases where what we're now seeing, you know, as you say, COP 26 years on, now that we're deep into the climate crisis, it's, you know, wait a minute, you know, we are facing some issues here at home and now it's that research trying to catch up. So I just, mm. yeah, I just think there's always just being focused on them, look at their problems down there, look what's going on down there. And now it's like, wait a minute, we're also facing these injustices um, up yeah. here with research on that. And, you know, and sometimes uh, some of our more vulnerable residents are, are women, um, you know, women, uh, elderly women, uh, you know, women that, uh, that don't have proper housing, you know, all of those uh, factors or all those folks would face increased uh, issues with, uh, with climate change. So uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it won't be too long before that, uh, that uh, research gap is uh, filled, but no, very much appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, Councillor Stoddard. How about you? Any comments or questions? Hi, just a couple of, um, I guess, comments. Thank you so much, Noreen, for your presentation. Um, it was captivating, that's for sure, and a lot of information in there. Um, I know in certain places like um, out west where they're looking at a lot of the um, gas and natural gas and oil sectors, they're looking at other ways for them to um, branch over into other industries like te technology and this and that. But I noticed that a lot of times they're not um, including women that are out there and I'm sure there must be a few. And, you know, they're not including them in the upgrading and, and I just find that kind of strange that you don't hear about them. Um, because I believe, as you said, we, we should be able to train all of our women and those that are not, that are, that are in jobs that refer to the climate or are gonna be affected by the climate. 
they should be included, uh, women and transgender, and we should get rid of the stigma, a woman, what's a woman's job, what is her place, you know? I think that's, that should be gone. It should, there should be no stigma there. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Stoddard. So I'll just uh, share my comments as well. So I too want to echo everyone who has said, thank you, Noreen. That was a very, um, for me, it was a very insightful uh, presentation. And um, I have to say, when you, you know, extrapolated sort of the data about women's employment and then um, the climate, the impact on the climate and connected the two for us here in uh, Eastern Nova Scotia and Eastern Canada, I just went, duh, of course, of course, you were so right. But I hadn't, I hadn't connected those dots until you made this presentation. So I really um, am grateful to you uh, for that, for helping me and my little brain connect those dots. And it also then made me think that if I haven't connected those dots, and I, you know, I'm an, I'm not a person who who's working in the service industry or the tourism industry, but it makes me wonder if we have women here in uh, Halifax in the HRM who are working in these industries who also haven't connected the dots that they they are working in these industries and they don't they don't understand that this climate change could have such a negative impact on their livelihood. Um, and so just a question about that, and then I have another comment, but just a question, do you think, um, uh, I guess, like you said, there's always more to be done, but what do you think about whether or not women who are working in the service industry, whether they understand the impact that climate change may have on them? Yeah, and I mean, to you know, not make a generalized um, conversation as I have actually never um, interacted with uh, women working in this industry. But what I think is that this, again, stresses that importance of being on the ground and being in community and having these conversations, because what it's either going to do is educate those who aren't aware, or actually they might say, we've been knowing this for the past 20 years and haven't been hurt. So yeah, it just, yeah. again, yeah. stresses being in community and having conversation. Yeah, so that might be uh, something that uh, sort of we, we take away. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, we have some staff people here, Carolyn and, and Amy, do either of you, I think we have a little bit of time. Would either of you like to um, weigh in here with any questions or comments? No, hearing none. So I guess the, the other uh, comment. Hi, Jen. Oh, sorry, sorry Christine, I... I'm sorry. I'm, oh, no worries. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm got, I got ahead of myself. Thank you, Christine, I apologize. She is also on the list and uh, here, over to you. I jumped in ahead of you, sorry about that. No worries. And I just want to say thank you, Noreen, for the presentation. It's very uh, insightful, especially you mentioned the tourism sector, which is a very important sector here in Halifax. And then when we kind of link the, the dots together, just like what Jim mentioned earlier. It's, uh, it's, it's like very important. And also Council's uh, Blackburn mentioned earlier, like uh, there's lots more research like uh, somewhere else, like about, I think it's important to have more research locally. So if there's anything, uh, what we can do, feel free to reach out to us, write us a letter or send us an email, happy to help. Sure. Thanks, Christine. Sorry, again, my apologies. The um, one comment I was wanting to make is just um, in regard to our concerns, our feelings about sometimes feeling hopeless when we are facing these huge, huge issues and thinking, well, what can we do? And I really appreciated, Noreen, your, your suggestion that sometimes reframing things helps us um, adopt a more hopeful stance. And one of the things that I've always, um, I, I was a professor, so I spoke to students. And one of the things I always left my students with, and I attribute this saying to Confucius, but I have no idea if that's correct or not, but I still will attribute it to Confucius. 
And the saying is that it is better to light one candle than curse the darkness. And uh, so I think sometimes hanging on to that idea that we can light one candle rather than cursing the darkness might, uh, might help us uh, just keep on keeping on. And um, so Noreen, thank you for, for your keeping on uh, and steadfast work on this very important topic. And hopefully we will be able to join you and uh, in support of your work and, and, and move it along a little bit more. I yeah, know uh, you're welcome and thanks for having me. It was great to present to you folks. Good. Well, thank you. I think uh, we'll, unless anyone else has anything you'd like to end with, I think we have a minute or two, but I think you are seeing some clapping. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Noreen. All right. So um, that takes us to our next uh, topic, which is, um, I'm sure will be uh, thought provoking. And that is, uh, we're going to hear from Taylor Hill and uh, uh, Sarah Colburn and from uh, Caroline Hemstock, our staff member who are going to present um, uh, some survey results. So I'm gonna turn it over to Caroline who's going to do the introduction. And I think we'll also have some remarks to say during the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just looking for Taylor and Sarah in the little bar at the top. Are, is everyone here? Are they? I'm not sure if I'm just having a tech issue. Yep, I see yes, you. I'm okay, here. wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, hello to all the committee members and to Councillors Blackburn and Stoddard. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Taylor Hill and Sarah Colburn, which I have the pleasure of working with for almost the last year on this project. Um, they're here today to share some results from the, Novus, uh, from the Women's Quality of Life in Halifax Regional Municipality report. Um, and this, this is a team that's done incredible research uh, through the Nova Scotia Quality of Life survey that was undertaken in 2019. Um, when we came to engage uh, almost a year ago and asked them if they could review their unique and large data set um, using a gendered lens, they, were, they, they said yes to the challenge and I'm very grateful that they did. They've been very collaborative and helped us to better understand the quality of women living in Halifax Regional Municipality through this report. Um, which is really first of its kind. So I'm going to introduce you to Taylor, who's the research coordinator and data analyst over at Engage, as well as Sarah Colburn, who's the managing director at Engage Nova Scotia. So I'll hand it over to Sarah and to Taylor. Thanks, Thanks Carolyn, for the introduction. Great. Uh, so as Carolyn said, my role at Engage Nova Scotia is focused on data analysis. And this includes managing the survey data set coordinating data access for institutions and also leading data analysis for organizations and individuals. Next slide, please. Uh, so a bit of information about Engage. Um, we're a nonprofit and our vision is a more vibrant, inclusive and resilient province. Since 2017, our focus has been the Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative. We see ourselves as sitting at the intersection of the public, private, academic, and community sectors. Next slide, please. Um, the Nova Scotia Quality of Life survey was undertaken in spring 2019. Um, it asked 230 questions about eight domains of well being. We had almost 13,000 Nova Scotians respond. And so we continue to gather groups of people across the province to consider the results of the survey. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, and so the Nova Scotia Quality of Life Survey was based on the CIW's Community Wellbeing Frameworks National Survey, one that's been administered in over a dozen communities across Canada. And so today I'm going to talk about a report that we uh, created in collaboration that's from the Nova Scotia Quality of Life Survey. Um, it was undertaken in the province in 2019. The survey questions are organized by domain according to CIW's eight domains of well-being framework. I'm going to touch briefly on the purpose of the analysis with Carolyn, uh, and then I'm going to characterize the women in the HRM who responded to the survey. 
I'm going to also talk a bit about quality of life indicators across all women in HRN who responded to the survey organized by topic. And then also three select socio-demographic groups that we'll focus on, um, which in preliminary analysis showed meaningful differences compared to the broader population of women in HRN. I'll also touch briefly on the strengths and limitations of the survey. Uh, next slide, please. And I believe Carolyn is going to also um, help me describe the purpose of the analysis. Shall I jump in, Taylor? Sure, thank you. Wonderful. So really this, this, um, this report um, kind of the, the began when the diversity and inclusion framework uh, for HRM uh, was approved a few years ago. So as part of that work, we've been uh, as a municipality looking at identifying and addressing systemic barriers in our policies, our practices and our programs so that HRM can really truly capitalize on the strengths and talents of all of our community members, particularly and in including women, gender diverse and non-binary people. And so, you know, we were looking at other municipalities across Canada um, and their promising practices, such as uh, the city of Edmonton um, in the area of gender equality. And this report was, you know, reports that were developed to provide a benchmark in, in understanding and making progress towards improving women's quality of life over time. So, you know, at the same time, we've been looking at the use of gender-based analysis plus, as the committee knows, and um, how to use evidence to understand issues facing women and gender diverse people. And we recognize that there was a gap in terms of our sex and gender disaggregated data in HRM. So um, that's kind of what led us to partnering with Engage Nova Scotia. Um, I think this work is really vital because we can't improve our programs and services if we don't understand the issues that are facing the people that live in the municipality. And so last August, a few months ago, the report was finalized and we're really excited about the reports because um, this can help us to make more inclusive decisions and it can help the municipality to advance gender equality in the work that HRM employees do every day. So, Learnings from this report are being shared with HRM staff. Um, in fact, we're gonna be having a lunch and learn next week with Engage Nova Scotia um, to share the results and how people can use it within their work. And it's also informed our work that we're doing around a gender equity strategy. And so um, I know Taylor and Sarah are going to speak to the details of the report, the results and the analysis because they're very much the experts in that. But I just wanted to say that, you know, our intention as we move forward is to use this evidence to help deepen and expand our understanding of, of what's, what it means to be women, gender diverse and non-binary people in HRM and how this perspective can be both you know, broadened and deepened um, so that the people who are doing well and those that are at risk of falling behind um, are captured in the decisions that we make. And we're planning to go and have more conversations with uh, women and gender diverse and non-binary people as we develop our, our gender equity strategy. And so a few people a few communities that we'll be focusing on holding conversations with are the 2S LGBTQ plus community, the urban indigenous um, community and people identifying as living with a physical, uh, physical disability amongst others as we move forward with this work. So I'll give it back to you, Taylor. Thank you. Um, so the first step of the analysis entailed identifying all the variables from the survey through a, a very iterative um, and collaborative process. We held meetings weekly during decision-making processes to identify priority topics uh, and then to develop an analysis plan. Next slide, please. So the experiences of quality of life that I'm going to speak to today reflect 182,770 women living in HRM. Next slide, please. Of these respondents, nearly all of them reported being born in Canada and nearly one quarter reported a mental health challenge that impacts their participation in the community. Nearly three quarters reported currently having a partner and about half of these women reported being a parent. We identified women as any individual who in response to a survey question on gender identification reported identifying as female. And we'd also just like to acknowledge that the results were presented here reflect the lived experiences of real women who live in Halifax Regional Municipality. Next slide, please. So the eight domains of well-being um, that are aligned with the CIW uh, Community Well-Being Survey Framework are listed here. They include environment, education, living standards, leisure and culture, 
community vitality, democratic engagement, time use, and healthy populations. Next slide, please. So the first domain that I'm going to speak to is called community vitality. It measures quality of life with respect to the communities that we live in. And these indicators tell us about what is happening in our neighborhoods, how safe we feel, and whether or not we are engaged in community activities or are socially isolated. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I have a map of the average level of perceived safety walking alone after dark for women in HRM. And so we can see that across HRM with those landmark uh, reference points labeled, women's feelings of safety walking alone after dark varies. So here, the darker colors represent lower perceived safety and the lighter represents relatively higher perceived safety. So for example, dark blue would reflect the lower range of answers and yellow would reflect areas where women reported feeling most safe walking alone after dark. We can see that women in the satellite areas of HRM, like Bedford and Fall River, and urban surrounding areas like Sambro Prospect area, tended to report feeling safe walking alone after dark. And these results also suggest that feeling safe alone after dark is lower for women in the Sackville area, North Dartmouth, and the Fairview Clayton Park area. Next slide, please. The Healthy Populations Indicators tells us about dimensions of self-reported physical and mental well-being, individual behaviors and perceptions, and circumstances that influence health. Next slide, please. Here, we're looking at a graph on perceived access and quality of healthcare services in the community, as well as self-rated mental and physical health that's compared across three groups. So we have women in HRM who answered our survey, compared to women in the broader province of Nova Scotia, as well as men in HRM. So we can see that the results are comparable across the three groups. And in general, perceptions of healthcare accessibility are slightly lower than perceptions of healthcare quality. Next slide, please. The next domain is education. And these indicators tell us about motivation for pursuing learning, the availability access to and experiences of formal education and courses of interest, as well as participation in traditional or cultural learning opportunities. Next slide, please. So here I have well-being indicators graphed across various levels of education of women in HRM. It shows that women with advanced education, those who graduated from undergraduate or graduate programs, reported higher satisfaction with half of the indicators. So for example, neighborhood uh, livability, personal relationships. We can also see that women whose highest education level is high school or equivalent reported higher satisfaction with financial situation and local government. Next slide, please. This domain is democratic engagement, and it measures quality of life in terms of being part of advancing democracy through political institutions, organizations, and activities. These indicators tell us about interest and participation in democratic activities. Next slide, please. Here, I've mapped women's perceived benefit from government policy and programs. So the survey question reads, have the programs and services of the local government made you better off? The darker colors show lower perceived benefit and the lighter colors show higher perceived benefit. We can see that community level differences emerge across women where the more urban areas of HRM, like downtown Halifax, uh, downtown Dartmouth and the peninsula showed higher perceived benefit of policy and programming relative to other areas. Next slide, please. The next domain is leisure and culture. It measures quality of life in terms of participation and engagement with the arts, culture and recreation. These indicators tell us about perceptions, experiences, and accessibility as they relate to physical, social, and cultural activities. Next slide, please. So here we have indicators of accessibility of community cultural and recreational facilities compared across the same three groups. Women in HRM who answered our survey, women in the broader province of Nova Scotia, as well as men in HRM. So we can see that a frequently reported barrier is the cost of program participation although park access and having a sense of welcome at the facilities is both high. Next slide, please. This is a map of women's reported satisfaction with access to parks in their HRM community. So again, here, darker colors represent lower satisfaction with access, lighter colors represent higher satisfaction with access. We can see that perceived access to local parks was quite varied across communities in HRM. Women in the Sackville area reported the lowest satisfaction with accessibility to local parks, with women in downtown Halifax and Dartmouth reporting higher satisfaction with perceived access. Next slide, please. 
This domain is environment and it explores environmental protection and the accessibility and quality of the natural environment. These indicators tell us about perceptions and personal practices. Next slide, please. This is a map of women's reported satisfaction with the quality of the natural environment in their HRM community. So here, darker colors represent lower satisfaction with the quality of the environment and lighter colors represent higher satisfaction. We can see that the areas of Halifax and Sambro and parts of both Halifax and Dartmouth report relatively lower uh, scores on satisfaction with the quality of the environment relative to the other areas. Next slide, please. This domain is living standards. It asks about work experiences, work-life balance, and experiences of financial insecurity. Next slide, please. When asked about the frequency of experiences of financial insecurity in the past year, women in HRM experienced less frequent financial insecurity than women in the province overall. Relative to men in the province, women in HRM and the broader province experienced more frequent financial insecurity. This is in terms of having money for food, um, being able to pay housing costs, being able to pay utility bills. It's actually that about one third of women in HRM reported not having been able to purchase nutritious food or be able to pay their bills on time. About one quarter ate less because there wasn't enough food. Next slide, please. This domain measures time use and the indicators tell us about how people spend their time, experience time, factors influencing time use and how time use impacts well-being. Next slide, please. So this graph is a little different from the previous one. We've compared average time spent caring for family members across women of different age groups relative to women overall in HRM. So we can see that time spent caring for children inside the family is highest among middle-aged women. They typically spend about 66 hours caring for children per week. Older women also spend substantial hours per week caring for family members. They typically spend 24 hours caring for older adults and 14 hours caring for children. Next slide, please. So this next section is on um, those three sociodemographic groups that in our preliminary analyses showed meaningful differences from the general population of women in HRN. Next slide, please. The first group um, is women in HRN who responded to the survey and reported identifying with the statement, mental health challenges limit participation in the community. These women reported lower levels of well-being on all of the 16 overall well-being indicators including indicators of trust and confidence and sense of community. Next slide, please. These results represent women in HRM who responded to the survey and said that they've been in the community for less than five years. These women reported a lower sense of belonging to their community, lower satisfaction with personal relationships, lower trust in media, as well as a lower sense of community. Next slide, please. And finally, these results represent women in HRM who responded to the survey and said that they don't have Canadian citizenship. These women reported lower trust in some institutions and lower confidence in some systems, but they reported higher trust in all levels of government, including federal, provincial, and the local municipal government. Next slide, please. So in general, we can see that when women are experiencing lower or higher quality of life, the differences tended to emerge in their sense of belonging, trust, having confidence in com community institutions. Uh, and the findings here should be interpreted with the understanding that there are limitations of the data. For example, those who reported their ethnic identity were limited to the options available on the original survey. And this limitation is present on questions such as gender identity, uh, marital status, and household composition. And it's particularly highlighted by the lack of information presented about Mi'kmaq and other Indigenous women. We didn't undertake the survey on reserve, and so we're not sharing distilled data about Mi'kmaq and other Indigenous survey respondents. And this is because of our ongoing consideration of the First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession, also known as OCAP, which assert that the First Nations have control over data collection processes and that they own and control how this information can be used. Overall, the information presented in the full report contextualizes quality of life for a sample of women using a data set that is unique in scope and size. Further surveying will be enhanced with consideration for the culturally aware pathways to quality of life. And it'll allow us to paint a picture of the trends present in women's quality of life over time. And we hope this, this information will help shed light on the gaps, strengths, and experiences of women who live in Halifax Regional Municipality, Nova Scotia. 
Next slide, please. Uh, thanks for listening and reading. Um, you can talk more about the results with us by getting in contact with us um, or talking about it with us today. You can also read the complete summary results and the supplementary analysis if you haven't already. It's all on our website. And you can also stay in the loop by joining our newsletter and following us on social media. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. That's very, very interesting. So as we did before, we'll go around and uh, I'll try not to forget anybody. So let's again start with Hanin, please. Um, thank you so much, uh, all three of you, for the presentation. Um, could we actually come back to me? I'm sort of percolating a few questions and then- Sure, sure we can. Yeah, well, and, and if I don't remember, you remind me, okay? <laughs> sure we can. Uh, Lily, let's go to you. Thank you, and that was a very informative presentation. So thank you for bringing this research to our attention. I know um, in the beginning of your presentations, you had mentioned that this is looking into the quality of life, not only for women, but also um, gender diverse and non-binary folks, but then I didn't hear, would, didn't see any data pertaining to that or hear more about it later in the presentation. So I'm wondering in what way you've engaged in um, looking at what the quality of life for gender diverse folks in HRM is like. Yeah, so one of the limitations of the 2019 survey is that it asked what is your gender and the possible answers that you could choose, including checking a box, uh, were male, female, or the option to specify. Um, and so in this analysis, we included people who responded female to the question about the gender that they identify with. Uh, but when we survey them, we're going to look forward to providing much more possible responses that extend beyond um, that binary measure. So there's currently not data around how, how are in your in your research of how gender queer diverse folks experience quality of life. Okay. Uh, not currently in HRM, there was 14 people who responded not identifying with male or female, and so if we show that on a map, um, not just in a graph, but particularly on a map, it could identify those people. Um, so we just stuck with those who reported um, uh, identifying as female. All right, thanks. Thanks, Lily. And uh, Joanne, how about you? Any comments or questions here? Um, yeah, my questions were uh, similar to Lily's actually, because it's there's actually a large part of the population that's left out of it. Um, well, not a, compared, but a percentage. And the so what I'm wondering is, I mean, first of all, thank you for doing the work. It's a lot of work. And I really appreciate that because graphs and stats are not my thing. Um, so I guess the thing is when you don't have the disaggregated uh, statistics, then there's the tendency of the non-marginalized results to lead the less marginalized. And so everybody thinks they're doing the thing that doing it all correctly. And I'm not, that's not a dis of you. It's just the question is more, I guess, is this already gone to the people who make decisions about, oh yeah, we need this or that. Um, and what is the timeline in terms of taking these, uh, this data further? Um, and just to clarify, do you mean the report itself? Yes, I do. Okay, um, so I can't really speak for HRM, but uh, at Engage, we are sort of working to make sure that as many possible or, uh, people as possible are aware of these results and as sort of what's possible with them, how they can be used to advocate for change um, so that people can be sort of better informed of, of where to go from here. Um, but we actually don't offer specific programs or service delivery or really undertake uh, policy making, but we actually just make sure that the people who do that um, are supported by the information that we have. Um, and so the information here can be used to make those sort of evidence-based or data-driven decisions um, as a tool for those who are in, in program design and, and service delivery. Um, I guess my question, maybe I wasn't exactly clear um, because I think we're in agreement that all the information we need is not really here in terms of different communities and more marginalized communities. 
So if the report is already going to people to use the data and, and you know, create new programs or even to get a better understanding of what's going on, um, it's not complete data, I guess, is my response. Yes, it is. It is focused um, narrowly on those who identified as being female. And it's, um, yeah, it's in no way reflecting every possible uh, gender identification that could be there. Caroline, did you want to speak to that as well, to this question or comment? Yeah, I, I would. I would. Um, thank you for that, um, for that comment, Joanne. And that's really a really important uh, perspective. And we have certainly considered that in HRM at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So the information, the report has been shared uh, throughout the organization um, and, and all the business units. And we're working on supporting HRM staff through education so that they can um, you know, they ha have access to the report, but also inviting Engage to obviously present the result in a way that is maybe a little bit more approachable, considering that research isn't always accessible to everybody. Um, but to speak to the limitations. So in when we disseminated the information to the organization, we provided, um, you know, basically a briefing note, which explained some areas where we want to um, learn more in the future, right? So Engage has been wonderful in helping us understand what are the limitations and what are the strengths, and that was highlighted to HRM staff. So um, it was we were quite clear in our messaging to say that this re reflects the, the the demographic profile that the report uh, summarizes, and that it's not representative, for example, of urban Indigenous women simply because uh, the survey results don't um, they don't cover that particular population. But we're really committed to understanding those experiences having more conversations and um, yeah, in integrating that into our decision-making because we, it's very, very important. And we recognize that women and non-binary people and gender diverse people are, all, there's a lot of diversity within those communities and we need to make sure that we understand the issues impacting all of them. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, Taylor too. And thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, would you like to? comment or questions. Um, hi there, thank you so very much for this. Um, I found this, uh, started reading the report and uh, just fascinated by the uh, the findings. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, uh, you know, much has been said about uh, the, uh, the, the gaps that are in this research, but, um, you know, from a, a counselor perspective, this is really a good place to start. I mean, this is the type of information that, uh, gets us thinking. Uh, for example, I, you know, based on uh, this information presented today, it looks like uh, uh, women in Sackville have a serious case of the grumpies. And so, you know, it, now that that gives, you know, as somebody who is a, a counselor for the Sackville area, it allows me the opportunity to dig in and find out a bit more about, you know, what is it about the services that are not meeting their needs? Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly from my perspective, this is just fascinating to, uh, to have. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, this is the type of information that, uh, that we as counselors can really use to gain insight into uh, our communities. And just, you know, just out of curiosity, just wondering what, what you see as the best use of this uh, data. When you, you know, present this data, uh, what ultimately do, do you want to see done with it? Yeah, I hope that, like, I think the ultimate goal would be to sort of raise awareness. Um, and it's really a, a resource or a tool um, for future work, specifically for policy and, and programming and service delivery. Um, but I, I see it really as sort of an, an, like a knowledge is power sort of informational piece um, to support mm -hmm. all kinds of work. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about, you know, the, the safety issue of the piece about uh, walking alone after dark, you know, so in now, it, it, you know, that's something that we as counselors can take to our public safety office and say, hey, listen, you know, Engage has this information that indicates women in these areas don't necessarily feel safe, you know, maybe we need to concentrate some programs there or uh, make some changes to how we do things so that uh, they do feel safe and uh, and they are safer. But uh, no, much appreciated. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Stoddard. 
Yes, I thank the three of you for this presentation. Um, it was interesting to see how in one area of Nova Scotia, how different sections can be so different from the other. As Councillor Blackburn was saying, you know, you have Sackville, which feels isolated and, you know, more concerned at nighttime than maybe you would in the downtown core. But you would think in the downtown core that there'd be more people, more opportunities to, you know, you know, I don't want to say being pickpocketed or something like that, but, you know, and it's kind of the reverse. So that was kind of interesting to see. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. It is eye-opening. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Christine, not to be yeah, forgotten. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, three of you, for the presentation. And uh, personally, I really like Engage Nova Scotia. I remember a few years ago when the now never report kind of uh, Engage Nova Scotia has a ban. And also in the past few years, before COVID, there was a shared Thanksgiving event I find is very meaningful, especially for people like myself is uh, like an international graduate, uh, immigrant. And uh, about the report, uh, it's interesting to find that uh, uh, people, uh, women, will sell uh, uh, a citizen, Canadian citizenship, uh, they feel like a, a kind of lack of sense of uh, uh, belonging in the community. And uh, I'm wondering if that's something uh, with HIM, like uh, with, with the uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we can use the data to uh, do something with it. And, and also uh, one question for Carolyn. I know this report is kind of like a, a, a benchmark. I'm wondering, for example, in the next few years, are we considering doing again to see how much improvement we have done uh, since the benchmark has been established? That's a great that's a great question, Christine. Um, I will definitely share it with my team and I'll I'll bring that back to the committee with a decision. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Uh, honey, do you have now that you've had a minute or two? Are you any comments or questions? Yeah, I, I was just trying to narrow it down, um, honestly. So I, I do appreciate the um, the commentary on women who do not have Canadian citizenship. Um, cause I think that's very important. Uh, my sort of premise question is citizenship. Are you defining that by actual Canadian citizenship or is that PR like permanent residency falls within that according to this? Uh, the question was on Canadian citizenship. Yeah. Okay. So permanent residency yeah. does not fall within that. Uh, I mean, I think that the survey respondents can sort of interpret it as they as they will. Um, there's not someone to sort of clarify that for them while they're filling it out. Um, so some people could have interpreted it that way. But when I read it, I had interpreted it as um, full citizenship. Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose my my question is, there's certainly, you know, I, I work a lot with newcomer women um, and immigrants and those who specifically access uh, legal aid services and such, and they always feel a sense of, you know, lack of safety, lack of uh, belonging. They struggle to belong anywhere um, within their own community and outside of it. So, and I guess what what strikes me is that the map is not always reflective of the reality because people sort of just go wherever makes sense and they don't actually understand what Halifax, you know, what, what Halifax is. They don't really know. They're just, they go wherever and then they end up there. Um, and I guess, sorry, I'm at the office and someone's vacuuming. Um, I guess my question is, is I'm really wondering if, if there is any way to take this information um, and be able to narrow it down in a way that helps us understand how we can help these women and how we can really better address their concerns, especially if it's sort of just all over the map um, with the way that they access community community services, the YMCA and so just random things like that. Um, how can we help them if, I, I guess I'm, I'm, 
yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how we can help them when they're so disconnected. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think one thing we could do is not look at it on a map and instead look at it in a different form. So um, if, if like geographic location or like specific communities, like geographic communities aren't um, as relevant for that question, um, then it might make sense to look at those who report not having Canadian citizenship and those who do and see sort of where they differ and what's actually going on. Um, I think the map is sort of one way to look at it if, if um, the geographic location is relevant to the question, um, but certainly that's only one way to look at it. Um, we can see, um, Caroline, is there anything you want to add maybe uh, to that question? Answer? Not at this time. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think looking at it in terms of a graph and not a map and looking at things like sense of community, um, uh, experiences of community cultural facilities being welcoming um, and those sorts of barriers would certainly uh, be informative. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, honey. And uh, I thank you, Taylor. So that was uh, uh, a good amount of information in a, in a short time. And I know Taylor is probably trying to um, encapsulate a lot of information. And so maybe some information that would have been helpful um, maybe you can help us with now. So I'm thinking specifically, um, Councillor Blackburn, you're worrying about the folks in Sackville, but, but what uh, I think Taylor told us is relative information. So she said Sackville was less, felt less safe, but the, the first question you have to ask yourself is how safe do they feel? So if the scale is one to seven, and Bedford is at 6.96, and Sackville is at 6.95, mm. it is correct to say that Sackville feels less safe than Bedford, but there's, is it a significant difference? Yeah, exactly. So, so, or, you know, is it the case that Bedford, when it comes to safety, is at 2.2 and Sackville's at 2.1? So neither of them really feel particularly safe. So. I think if Taylor had more time, she might have shared with us the actual means, what we call means averages. I'm a researcher, so I think like a researcher. She went and shared with us the where they fit on the scale. Are they at the high end of the scale, at the bottom of the scale? Is one right at the top of the scale, is one right at the bottom of the scale? So when you're when we're doing those comparisons between communities, I think uh, Taylor, you might agree that it's really important to know exactly what the means are uh, between and the differences in those means and whether there's significant differences or just that they differ. Yes, I definitely agree. I think the map sort of shows just general variation, even if that variation is small and it is um, all relative. So what, if one area is um, sort of high or low on one question, it is determined by the, like the neighboring area if they're high or low. Um, yeah, so it is, yeah, it's definitely relative rather than absolute. Yeah, and then the other question I had to just comment was to still, un, I'm trying to understand the actual survey. So I, the report said that you got survey responses from un, under 13, not fewer than 13,000 people. Were those 13,000 people in Nova Scotia or those 13,000 people in the HRM? 13,000 across Nova Scotia. So how many respondents were from the HRM? Uh, 4,475. And how many of those were women? Uh, 2,357. So you got pretty good distribution between males and females in the HRM. Yeah. Yeah, it's nearly, um, it's, yeah, it's about like 45, 55, almost equal. Okay. And then how, how, did you, how did you get people to respond to the survey? Yeah, so the sampling design um, was very strategic and, and quite complex. There was a couple of different approaches, um, one being advertising the survey um, and offering a couple of mediums to, to, to uh, answer it. So um, there's about 80,000 households in Nova Scotia who were invited to participate. Um, about 16% of them did participate and they were able to answer the survey online or they were offered a uh, envelope in a hard copy survey that they could mail back to us. Um, and so there was also a sort of a, uh, an oversampling done for particular communities that 
traditionally don't participate in surveys or in more rural areas. Um, so there was more concentrated efforts there that was done in consultation with our partners, the Canadian Index of Wellbeing. And then to account for that, we also have population rates that was developed by Statistics Canada and the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, um, which is a quantitative survey technique that aims to correct undersampling or oversampling by um, being able to generalize the results beyond just the sample size we have. So when I say 182,770 women, um, it's not actually that many human beings. It's that the number of women that we have with the population weights, we can generalize the results to that number of women. So the 4,000, no, the 2,000 women who responded in the HRM, you can extrapolate that to say that that's representative of the 182,000. Is that what that was? That's exactly it, yep. 182,000. And so it's, it's possible, I think, but you don't know what, to what extent um, um, people were represented where you didn't ask what you didn't ask the demographic question, right? You just, it's not that you, they weren't necessarily represented. You just didn't ask a question that would identify them. Is that right? Like, um, uh, so, um, so the demographic part of the survey was, was quite um, comprehensive. The weights are, the population weights are based on age, um, sex and region. Mm -hmm. um, and the margin of error is about 1%. So it is quite, uh, quite reliable. But, but I was just saying, if I'm a Mi'kmaq woman, Mi'kmaq woman, and I answered it, you don't have a way to know that. Isn't that, is that right? Uh, we do, we, not those on reserves, but we do have um, a question on the survey that asked um, those to identify as Mi'kmaq women uh, living on reserve or off reserve. Um, so that question is there. Okay, so there's maybe some more data that, that could be gleaned from that. Yeah. And um, uh, the, the only other thing I was thinking about was um, well-being. So I, the, um, the organization, the broader organization defined those, those characters, those, what did you call them? Indicators. Oh, domains. Right? Yeah, the yep. domains. And finance wasn't one of them, was it? Uh, no, it's not one of them, but it is captured within living standards. Oh, okay. Okay. Sort of financial, financial well-being. Yeah. Interesting. The, uh, yeah. Interesting. Those are my comments. Any other comments or questions before we uh, move on to our next topic? Well, thanks again for that. Uh, uh, sorry. For that. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, I'm wondering if uh, for future, can we have a race kind of divide of data for that as well? Because I found this survey, it, I, I think this survey doesn't have like a racialized data, right? Uh, there is a question about ethnic identity. Okay, but the, because when I search it, I don't, on the report, I don't see it very clearly, but I feel it would be nice to have kind of intersectional uh, type of uh, information as a comparison. And, uh, and another thing uh, for probably for HM, uh, HIM Kellen, I was thinking for the Halifax partnership, every year they have something called Halifax Index, and uh, they may have some like an angle to look through the gender lens as well. And yeah, just wanted to come on that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Hey, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to add that um, the Halifax Partnership were the first um, data sharing agreement that we signed. So um, they actually have the data um, and, and used it a little bit for their Halifax Index. Caroline, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, one last comment on that. Thank you for that comment, Christine. I actually recently met with the partnership in as they're developing, I think, their next economic strategy. I might be getting the terms wrong, but um, we talked a lot about the engaged data, and I know that this particular report has been shared with uh, the, the partnership. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, very much, Taylor and Caroline and Sarah for being here as well. I appreciate uh, your taking time to be able to share that uh, important research with us. And we talk a lot in our committee. Um, 
some members of our committee keep reinforcing this over and over again, that we need uh, data to make uh, decisions. And uh, so it's really, really great to see that there is uh, some data uh, that can be used to help people make uh, informed decisions. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right, um, moving on to the next uh, agenda item. It was in information op items brought forward and there were none. And so that takes us to staff reports. And uh, that lead takes us right back to Caroline. So Caroline, are you ready to roll with the update on, from the Office of Diversity and, and Inclusion and an update on the GBA plus work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I will try and keep this brief. Um, in terms of gender-based analysis plus, the work continues. So I think it's just it's becoming integrated into uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So we have quite a few different initiatives that we're working on. So uh, next week, we're, we've invited um, and partnered with Engage to offer, as I mentioned, a lunch and learn um, speaker session. Um, it's GBA plus in action. And the first one to kick it off is looking at the women's quality of life report and how staff can use the, the report and the data from that in their work. And so I'm very excited about this because we've actually got several other members of the organization who are going to kind of show how they're using this data, how it's coming to life within, in, within their work. So we've got public safety there and we have the manager of digital services who's going to be uh, sharing how they're designing um, essentially data, or you know, products, visual visualization products for staff to use in their work, um, and that's done through the data sharing agreement that uh, HRM has with Engage Nova Scotia. Um, another thing that I'd like to mention is that our GBA Plus for HRM staff um, training is going to be launching formally through corporate training in January. Um, and we are going to be working on, we're working on the pre-engagement for a gender equity strategy that will support us in advancing gender equality uh, for the organization and within our communities. Um, so we're going to be meeting with community partners and residents over the next uh, few months and into uh, the, the new fiscal year. And um, there are two kind of dates that I'd like to highlight. Um, the Transgender Day of Remembrance, I believe it is later in the month. And then in December, we have the National Day for Action on, on Violence Against Women. I think it's December 16th. So just, just to keep on your calendars. Um, and that is it for me. Thank you, Caroline. Any questions or comments for Caroline? All good, then let's move on to Amy. Uh, Amy Brarley is going to give us a little update on the HRM Safe City and Safe Public, public spaces program. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much, Chair. And uh, yeah, I just have two short updates for you folks. Uh, since we last met, uh, the implementing committee for the Safe City and Safe Public Spaces program met, and that's made up of um, a variety of folks across HRM business units, also members from the Halifax Regional Police and RCMP. Uh, and that's the group that guides and advises the program. Uh, so we met for the first time since uh, we had completed the scoping study, and that was a really productive meeting. Meeting, um, and we're starting to see a lot of connections across business units to, to integrate uh, the intersectional and gender safety lens into folks' work. So uh, that was a really exciting uh, conversation. And uh, the second thing was that we also hosted a workshop with a group of planners who were interested in learning more about the women's safety assessment tool that we have been using in the public safety office. Um, and again, another great opportunity to chat with folks across business units to integrate the gender safety uh, and intersectional uh, safety lens into their work. So I uh, just wanted to, to let you folks know about those two things. Oh, thanks, Amy. Good stuff. Sounds great. Um, any comments or questions for Amy? All right. Um, that takes us to um, committee activity. And Hanin uh, is going to bring forward, I think Hanin's still with us there, is going to bring forward a motion that has uh, as a result of her presentation and then her discussion with us as committee members and involvement of other um, committee members. And um, Hanin, are you there? I'm not seeing you on my screen, so. Actually, I, I don't think Hanin is uh, online at this moment. I don't see her on the list. 
don't see her either. Haruka, can you see? Can you tell? No, I cannot. Hanin is not in attendance. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we have a motion here uh, for our consideration. Um, Haruka, do we still have a quorum? I think Hanin's at an attendee. If we can make her the panelist, she can come back. Haruka, I'm going to leave that to you. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Ah, there she is. Can't hear you. Sorry, hi, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. All right. I, my computer was shutting down and I wanted to make sure I had uh, everything figured out and I was, I could hear all of you talking about me, but I, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're very glad that you're back. I think okay. that uh, uh, someone else would have spoken to your motion and um, would have managed, but we're glad to have you here because you are the one that's driven the bus on this. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I really appreciate everybody withstanding technology has not been mentioned today. Um, so the motion, we've all had it circulated. Um, and basically the motion is that uh, the Women's Advisory Committee recommend that the Executive Standing Committee request a staff report that investigates other municipalities' work around anti-Muslim hate and racism and make recommendations on potential actions to combat anti-Muslim hate and racism in Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, we worked on this. Um, Jane helped us and Haruka, thankfully, and Caroline and uh, Tanya and everybody's been really, really helpful and wonderful. Um, it took a while to get it out there, uh, but we worked on it. Um, and yeah, that's that's the motion. Uh, unless someone has questions or anything. Uh, I'm going to call for a second. Thank you. Councillor uh, Blackburn is seconding the motion. So if there are any questions or comments now, it's on the table. We can discuss it. If not, we can go right to the vote. Are you ready for the question? Question. All those in favor, uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion is carried. Good stuff. Thanks, Thank Anine. Thank you. Sorry for all the text situations. <laughs> no. Okay, the next item uh, is also an item where you have had an opportunity to read and review and comment and thank you to you for for your comments and input uh, and so um, the annual report has been prepared and it's been circulated and at this point i'm looking for an emo a motion that would accept the annual report that uh, i report prepared with help from haruka who ably provided all the data thank you haruka uh, so that the uh, motion would read that we accept the 2020-2021 annual Re Women's An Advisory Committee annual report as presented. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? I'll move that, Madam Moved Chair. by Councillor Blackburn. I second uh, I it. Move the, I move Sorry. that the Women's Advisory Committee uh, one, accept the 2020-2021 Women's Advisory Committee annual report as presented, and two, recommend that Executive Standing Committee accept the 2020-2021 Women's Advisory Committee annual report. I so move. And Christine, would you like to second that? Is that what you were trying to do? Yes, uh, I second it. Seconded by Christine. Is there any comments or questions? It's good work. Oh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you. It's, uh, it was, um, I just want to comment that uh, when we, when you, when I kind of reorganize the data, the, the information around our priorities, it's, and then the outcomes, and then we added in the subsequent out activities of the Executive Standing Council, it really affirmed that we were a busy, busy and effective committee last year. And I look forward to us doing the same thing again, so. Ready for the question? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion is carried. All right, uh, Councillor Stoddard, I believe you're going to give us a little update on the activities of the HRM Council. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank Councillor Blackburn for helping me with this. We have, um, I think, five regional councils since our last meeting. So we'll try to keep it brief. Um, so September 14th, regional council highlights. We had a second reading on the vehicle booting law. We awarded, awarded the tender of the new West Bedford Park and Ride. We approved the request to include 173 Creighton Avenue, Creighton Avenue, Dartmouth in their registry of heritage property. And we set out a date for a heritage hearing. The motion was passed for a staff report on rolling the stormwater right of way costs into the general tax rate. September 28th, we were approved a new dog off leash area, off leash area in the Governor's Brook area and the Shearwater Flyer Park on Caldwell Road. We approved Councillor Lovelace. Pam Lovelace to serve as a liaison to the Acadian and Francophone community. Uh, we awarded the tender of the renovations to the Dartmouth North Community Center. We passed a motion on a portable shower program pilot project to have staff run a report on this. We expanded our affordable housing grant program by $200,000. And October 5th, we held a public hearing on the keeping of egg laying fowl in all areas of HRN. We gave the first reading to our center plan project B and asked the public hearing to be scheduled. We passed a tax relief on a number of nonprofits in HRN. October 19th, we returned in, personal, in person for our meeting. <laughs> What a difference that made. Um, it was nice to see people not, you know. <laughs> um, we held two heritage, excuse me, hearings and agreed to add 1600 Summer Street and 5500 English Street to the Registry of Heritage Properties. Um, Councillor Smith submitted a petition with over 9,000 names asking for the Wallace Street to be renamed Rocky Jones Street. We passed a race to zero, zero motion, no, a race to zero motion signed by HRM up to, up to city climate commitments leading to the COP26 or COP26 conference in Scotland. And finally, October 26. We held a public hearing and passed the center plan B. 10 residents signed up to speak and changes were made were based on that feedback. We also had agreement to amendments on the temporary sign bylaw. We passed a less than market value license agreement with the Micmac Amateur Aquatic Club. A motion was passed to formally recognize Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth platinum jubilee in February by planting 70, if possible, oak trees, English or red, in honor of Queen Elizabeth's reign as a monarch for the last 70 years. And that concludes our update. Oh, thank you, Councillor yeah. Stoddard. Uh, any comments or questions for Councillor Stoddard? Could I just ask about the affordable housing? Way back, you, about midway, you said something about $200,000 for additional funds or something for affordable housing. Did I understand that right? Expanded the affordable housing grant program by $200,000. Yes. So what's the grant program? Would you mind if I pass that over to Councillor Blackburn? Sure. Please. I mean, I, don't, I just put you on the spot. I, I know you wouldn't. Okay. I'm That's just okay. kind of. <laughs> no worries. No, no. That uh, so that two hundred thousand dollars. That was our uh, sort of emergency response to the uh, homelessness situation that uh, oh. is occurring in yeah. Halifax. Um, it was uh, money that was earmarked to uh, purchase modular buildings that uh, are going to be set up on uh, on 
property somewhere in the uh, okay. the core of the city. We actually have an update on that uh, on that program or on that uh, that path that we were taking uh, coming on Tuesday when we have our next council meeting. We haven't seen the report yet, but uh, I guess we're going to have an update on that. But uh, yeah, basically okay. that was our sort of emergency funding that we earmarked for that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, given our emphasis on housing, you know, over over the last uh, while, that uh, that was uh, I thought helpful for us to know. Thank you. Um, next item. Uh, next two items, actually. Just I'll speak to those just briefly. The first one is um, work plan priorities, and just a reminder to you that uh, last year when we started our our year we did some brainstorming around what were our priorities? What were the issues that we thought our committee should focus on for the coming year? Uh, and you'll recall by looking at the annual report that we identified three priorities, although there were other issues that we thought were important. So, and then, and then we endeavored to uh, make sure that our, our meetings focused on our priorities. And I think to a large extent, we've done that. Uh, and so um, I'm going to ask next meeting for us to engage in a similar process. So I'm asking you to start thinking now about what you think the priorities for our committee for the next year should be. Um, they may be the same, they may be different, I don't know. I just want you to get, start giving some thought to that. And at the same time, be giving some thought to any individuals, groups or organizations that you might like to hear from. Um, we've started on the issue of climate and that really, that wasn't one of the top three priorities, uh, but we've uh, had a very good presentation on that today. And perhaps next meeting, if we can, we'll, we'll, I'll talk with probably further with Lily about this, whether we might have another presentation on climate um, while we're thinking further about our, our priorities. So that's what that, why that item is on the agenda, just to get you give you a heads up, that's what we're going to be doing. And uh, for you to be thinking about the priorities for this committee for the next uh, year. The next item is also a heads up. Um, you may recall uh, back uh, in the spring that uh, Caroline uh, was talking and took a very active role in planning International Women's Day and indicated then that she would like our committee to play a more active role in International Women's Day uh, 2022. So um, again, that's what I just am reminding you that that's uh, on our plate for us to be thinking about and uh, for you to be thinking about what, how you think um, International Women's Day could be celebrated in the HRM. Uh, how and what we might do to contribute to that. Uh, Caroline, I'll just uh, ask if you want to add anything uh, to this. Sure, certainly. Um, so last year, I mean, we had we were very grateful to have the participation of several members from the committee, including Christine and yourself, Madam Chair, and, and many councillors. So it, I, I think it was, um, although it was COVID and a virtual event, I think that it was you know, it was a really big success in terms of accessibility. We did a live stream. Uh, we had, you know, a virtual panel. We had people, we had kind of a hybrid uh, approach and we had several hundred people tune in. Um, we also had it recorded and then that was shared and, and distributed. So I think that was really wonderful. And the theme was um, resilience in the time of, women's resilience in the time of COVID. And we heard from Regine Willis, who's a social worker um, and a PhD candidate um, and an African Nova Scotian woman. Um, and really, I think, you know, just to emphasize that this event um, that's been hosted and organized by HRM over the last few years, it, you know, the, this, the event was the result of the hard work of the Visible Minority Women's Group, which was a group of HRM staff who got together and identified that there was a gap. They wanted to have, you know, an opportunity to celebrate International Women's Day have conversations about women's experiences and they saw that there was a gap in terms of accessible and inclusive international women's day events there's a lot of corporate and private events that are often associated with a pretty significant cost and if we think about reducing barriers to participation having that be accessible you know whether that's monetarily or physically is really important so um, as we move forward we want to continue to honor kind of the history 
of the group of women who started this work and continue to amplify um, the voices of Indigenous women, African Nova Scotian women, women who are racialized, um, for example, as we move forward with this and highlight the intersectionality, right? The intersections and the ways that oppression may uh, you know, impact women and gender diverse people differently. So um, as we are, you know, we're just in the beginning phases of our planning for the next year, we have convened uh, somewhat of a different committee this year. It's more of a partnership across community-based organizations, HRM, and we also have one of our partners is the Nova Scotia Advisory Committee on the Status of Women. And so I think as we go forward, we'd like to engage with the committee for your feedback and input and um, your participation. And I think Jane provided kind of an invitation for the committee to think about what that might look like. So um, I'm open to any and all suggestions and perhaps this is something that we can con continue to talk about the events in March. So uh, perhaps in some, you know, December meeting or January would be an ideal time for us to talk about that. Um, themes are kind of emerging from the UN women. So if you have suggestions about that, we'd also love to hear um, about what theme we should be uh, celebrating this year. Caroline, I'm wondering, would it be helpful to have a representative from this committee on your planning committee? Or is that necessary? I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but maybe it's the whole it's committee. I think it's a great idea. I don't know in terms of process or procedure how that works. So I'd rely on Haruka to guide us in terms of um, the committee's participation in other committees. Um, I don't know if that's too many layers, but yeah, so I'd rely on Haruka for that, but certainly that's something that we could explore if the process allows us to. Okay. Well, maybe we'll leave it at that and we'll take some guidance from Haruka after the meeting. And uh, if it uh, seems appropriate, then we'll uh, um, um, survey the committee members to see whether what the interest might be on that. Otherwise, we as an entire committee will do whatever we can to, uh, to be supportive and to provide input into the uh, celebration. I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda. Unless anybody has any other pressing issues that they would like to bring forward, I will call for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I still move. Uh, Hanin, I think I heard Hanin first. So I'll take uh, Hanin's uh, motion to adjourn. The meeting is adjourned and